it's not the conditions of our life. It's not even the events of our life. It's the meaning we take away from the event, which creates the emotion, which then generates the behavior. I lost my house, my wife's car got repossessed. We had the water turned off. I was so ashamed, completely emasculated. I felt like a fraud. Here I am selling the dream every day in my business life and living a nightmare. There's two types of people in life. Those that operate out of their history and their memory. Then there's happy and successful people. They operate out of their imagination and their vision. Eventually the one shows up the one who changes their total trajectory. It could be their emotional trajectory, their viewpoint on the world, their wealth, their abundance, their spirituality, but eventually the one shows up. I didn't get it just because I wanted it. I fought for it. I battled for it. I wanted it badly. I went broke. <laughs> and so, uh, and by the reason, the why, let me tell you why I went broke. I write about this in the book quite a bit. My identity wasn't of a wealthy man. Mm. Your identity is the thermostat setting of your life. It's really your worth. It's the thoughts, concepts, and beliefs you hold to be most true about yourself. And what started to happen is my results started to exceed what I believed I was worth. And I turned the air conditioner on and cooled myself right back down to who I thought I was. And we do this in every area of our life. We do it in love. We have a 75 degree love identity and we start meeting our dream person. You ever see that? And then a year later you broke up and you're back alone or you, you have a 75 degree fitness identity. You lose the 20 pounds a year later. It seems coincidental. It's a fluke and you've gained the weight back. You will always get your thermostat setting. So the key thing in life is to turn that identity thermostat higher and higher. And I talk extensively, as you know, in the book about how to do that. Pretty heavy, actually. And what happened was I went broke. And uh, I lost my house. My wife's car got repossessed. And I lost the power in our house, which is all bad. But if you've ever experienced this one, we had the water turned off. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, even talking about it now is hard for me. I mean, and I talked about it a lot. I haven't done it in a while, but we would have to get up in our apartment complex and climb down the stairs in the morning and go to the pool. And there's an outdoor shower there. And my, I'd hold a towel up where my new bride would take her shower so no one could see her outside, brush her teeth. Then we would switch and she'd hold the towel up and I'd shower and brush my teeth. And then we would walk back and then we would walk back. I was so ashamed completely emasculated. I felt like a fraud. Here I am selling the dream every day in my business life and living a nightmare. And it was one of the most difficult times in my entire life. I was very humbling, very humiliating, but it makes me grateful for what I have now. And I tell people off, it doesn't happen every morning, but I would say nowadays it happens maybe twice a week where I live at the ocean. So when I wake up in the morning, I'm looking at the Pacific Ocean, the waves crashing. When I leave here, I go to my island in Maine. I live on my own island. I look at the Atlantic Ocean. It's pretty cool. And I'm very grateful for that, but not as grateful as some mornings when I turn the water faucet on in the shower and the water hits my face. <laughs> and, I, and I literally have this flood of gratitude because of those moments back in the apartment. And I literally just say, thank you, God. Thank you so much. I'm more grateful for the water coming out of the shower than I am the ocean I look at when I wake up. And the reason for that is those moments. And so thank, thank God that I'm still grateful. And uh, sometimes our greatest pain will give us our greatest gratitude later. And I can tell you that that is very true for me. Speaking of gratitude and your wife, she called you out when you had felt all emasculated. And then you had another buddy of yours that called you out at a restaurant. God, can you talk a little bit about how in the world do you do this? It blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. My wife, who knew me, you know, she knew me, the, she knew the confident college guy, me, she knew, you know, my background and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, the truth is I was down and I was getting up later and I was laying around the house and I was, you know, uh, not being the guy I was capable of becoming. And she finally sat me down. She was working, by the way. She was supporting us. She had the job. People see me now, they're like, ah, oh, Mr. Superman, not so much, not at all. And uh, she basically called me out and said, hey, listen, this is it. You need to cut it out. This is not who you are. You were born to do something great with your life. You're not being the man that I grew up with. You're not the man that I know. You need to get your crap together because I'm getting up early and going to work every day. And every time I come home, you're sitting on the couch eating Cheetos and not getting our life together. And so she called me out and about the same time, another buddy of mine I work with is like, we had just done a sales meeting and he's like, who the heck was that guy? And I go, what do you mean? It was me. And he goes, bro, you seem so desperate, so unconfident. And mm -hmm. Bro, you're the one who always says certainty is influence, right? The most certain person influences, you seem the least certain, it was pathetic. You gotta wake up, man, you're better than this. And it was just, I was so, in this pattern of self-loathing 
and down on myself and repeating this story. I was telling myself this story of I had it going, I had it and I blew it and I had it. And I was manifesting this story over and over again because we really are the story we tell ourselves. And then finally, this buddy of mine who doesn't even know nothing about nothing goes, I go, bro, I'm just so down on myself. Then this just sucks, this situation I'm in. I'm broke, I owe everybody money. And he goes to me, I mean, he didn't even know what he was talking about. He goes, what would you need to believe about this so that it would actually serve you? Hmm. But we're driving, I go, I don't know. He goes, well, no, no. What would you need to believe about this so that it could actually serve you? And I'm like thinking about it. I'm actually kind of pissed at him for calling me out, but, but I grew up with him. So he's the best man in my wedding. <laughs> I go, well, be a hell of a comeback story. <laughs> one inspiring thing to tell people someday i swear to you i said i said man would that be a heck of a story i had no water now i'm a multimillionaire. man my wife's calling me out my best friend's calling me out now i'm successful and here we are now many many years later and exactly what i said is happening so i had to flip it wasn't the, the it's not the conditions of our life it's not even the events of our life it's the meaning we take away from the event which creates the emotion which then generates the behavior so it's never the event. You and I, for example, you and I could roll up on a car accident, terrible situation, and a family's going to die. And we run up and the family's passing away. You and I would say, this, this is tragic. Mother Teresa would roll up to that same car accident, same exact event, take a totally different meaning from it. She would tell you when she was alive, this is the honor of my lifetime, to be mm -hmm. present with a human being as their soul goes to heaven. Hmm. Totally different meaning, completely different emotion, completely different behavior, same event. So it is true that it is not the events of our lives that define us. That's why in some cases, you can take two children raised by an alcoholic father, and one goes down a spiral of repeating the entire, the entire debacle, and the other one becomes a mega achiever or happier person. Same event, different meaning, different emotion, different behavior. And do you remember what your, your idea of success was back in those days when you were having those conversations with your wife and your friend? Yeah, I think it was more shallow. I think candidly when I was younger, cause we didn't have things, but I lived near people who did. So I lived <laughs> in a neighborhood, like in the, down in the <laughs> hill, like in the bottom of a hill and all the rich people lived up on this hill. Right. And then me and my wife would come down ironically to the very beach that I live on right now. And we would walk on the beach. I'd see these people own these beach houses and I'd go, babe, Someday I'm going to get us one of those oceanfront houses. And I had mm. no idea. And I used to go, I go, who do you think these people are? They must be like Martians or something, you know, like who are, who lives on the ocean, right? So my original dreams were financial and that's okay. You know, that's okay. And I found out that, you know what I found out, by the way, about rich families or happy families that at some point in their lineage, way, 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 way back, they weren't. They weren't happy or they weren't successful financially. And then the power of one shows up. In the book, the second chapter is called The Matrix. I teach you about your reticular activating system. As you know, I go very deep on programming your RAS, the prefrontal cortex of your brain to find the things you want. But I use Neo in The Matrix as an example because what is Neo in The, in the Matrix called? The one. And in mm. every family, eventually the one shows up the one who changes their total trajectory. It could be their emotional trajectory, their viewpoint on the world, their wealth, their abundance, their spirituality. But in every family, eventually the one shows up. In my family, I'm the one. I'm the one. I didn't get it just because I wanted it. I fought for it. I battled for it. I wanted it badly. What I didn't know was that what I was really changing wasn't our financial status because that's great. But I have changed the way my family thinks. I've changed our viewpoint on life. I've changed how much we want to help other people. We actually do dream as a family. As you know in the book, and then I'll come up for air, I say there's two types of people in life. Those that operate out of their history and their imagine or their history and their memory. They just keep repeating their history and their memory and they operate out of it all the time. Then there's happy and successful people. They operate out of their imagination and their vision. When we're children, the reason we're happier, I honestly believe is our imaginations are flourishing. And as we get mm. older and we get into the world and we sort of get put in our box and, you know, our imagination gets suppressed. Our dreams get suppressed. And dreams and imagination are a little bit different. And our vision gets suppressed. And we just start to operate out of history, out of memory. And every day is like the other one. Or, and by the way, even when the external conditions change, the internal emotions are still the same history, the same memory. And so we change the external, but inside we still feel the same sadness, 
the same anxiety, the same worry, the same frustration, the same depression. So, but if you can begin to imagine a different emotion, dream about the different emotions, and instead of just getting intentional about your goals, what if you started to get intentional about the emotions you want to experience in your life? Because all the goals you have, you only want them because you think they'll make you feel something. Why not shortcut it and get consistent and congruent about what you want to feel? What you'll find mm -hmm. is if you can feel those things, you'll actually get the goals faster. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. What's interesting about your story in particular is, you know, I think we live in the society today where people want to know what the habit, what your morning habit, you know, yeah. oh, Ed jumps into cold water. I need to jump into cold water and then I'll be successful or Ed, you know, does this or that and I'll yeah. be successful if I do what he does. What they, what they oftentimes miss is that actually, actually, if you really look deeply at the story, Ed found his mindset in the unlikeliest of places in this McKinley home for disadvantaged boys. Yep. And that's where everything came together yep. because you realize that your dad, your alcoholic father had been inadvertently preparing you to not only have the impact that you had with those boys, but also to see life differently, to shift away from that shallow understanding of success to something completely different. So just talk a little bit about that transformation. This may be my favorite interview ever. <laughs> um, I'm not kidding. So again, my, everything happens for us and not to us. I think every thought leader says this now, but I can prove it to you. So my dad's first AA meeting, again, my dad's drinking, my dad's first AA meeting, he comes back, goes, I got you a job. And I'm at home, flunked out of baseball, graduated from college. I'm living in the same bedroom I grew up in, same teddy bear on the bed, same poster on the wall, eating out of his fridge. I said, okay, well, what's the job? He goes, dude, you don't get to decide. You're eating out of my fridge. Get your butt down there tomorrow and take this job. I go, you really don't know what it is? He goes, I have no idea what it is. And I show up there and it's an orphanage. Hundreds of boys. I was in cottage eight. My boys were eight to 10 years old. I am completely unqualified. I'm not a psychologist. I don't have children of my own. I'm flunked out of college. I don't even feel good about myself. And I walk into cottage eight at 630 in the morning. And immediately when I walk in, all these boys turn and look at me, all these precious little boys. My boys, their parents were dead, incarcerated, or had actually molested them. Mm -hmm. And these little boys looked at me with these eyes. And I recognize those eyes because I have them. Any child that grew up with any dysfunction, we have different eyes. And our eyes are, they say something very specific. And I want you to all hear me on this. Those eyes were telling me, and I didn't know I had it because I wasn't prepared. Love me. Care about me. Here's a big one. Believe in me, please. Mm. And show me how to live better. Love, care, believe, and show me how to live better. And it altered my life because I'd take them to school. I was there on Halloween when we trick-or-treated. I was there when they'd open their one present on Christmas. I was there when the girl didn't go out with them at a dance and it changed my life because I fell in love with helping other people. All of a sudden it wasn't about this ego old baseball player about, Oh, I'm this. It was, Oh my gosh, this, this isn't shallow. Like I was born to help people. This is my calling. Now I don't know if it's always going to be with children, but it's my calling. And it's while I worked there that I started my business career and I entered business very differently than almost anybody that I knew because this was so deeply in my heart now from being with my boys all day long. I'd be with them from six in the morning to sometimes, you know, two days in a row. And then I'd leave and go work in my business and come back. And when I found about every adult I've ever met, people say, how do you coach these people that run countries or entertainers or athletes? I'm blessed to coach some of the most successful people on the planet privately. Because here's the deal. Those boys aren't unique. Mm -hmm. Every human, every human, the most successful person you can think of want someone to truly love them, care about them, believe in them, and just show them how to do something better. And if you can in, get intentional about believing that and serving people that way, you'll be better at a parent, you'll be a better friend, you'll be a better business person, you'll be a better human. And that's why I love doing my show. We're both talking about we both love doing our shows. I love people. You put me in an Uber, I can tell you right now, here's the first thing I say, tell me your story. 
I want to hear their story. And by the time I get out of that car, if it's 10 minutes or 50 minutes, they're going to go, this guy loves me, man. He cares about me. He believes me. Yesterday, I get into an Uber. I got to tell you this because humans are the gift. You have to open them. Mm -hmm. Humans are a gift. Open them. I get in this Uber yesterday. Like I always do. My wife always laughs. Here we go. You know, and I said, hey, tell me your story. This man was from Lebanon. He's driving an Uber. You would easily judge him. His car was not nice. It was a little bit dirty in the back. He wasn't dressed meticulously. And he starts to talk to me about his journey to this country. Turns out, fast forward, this man has a daughter at Harvard, a son at Yale, and another son at Stanford. And he drives an Uber to help supplement for their tuition in addition to their college loans. And I thought, what a magnificent man. This is a great man. To have raised, I said, tell me about your wife. You must have a remarkable wife for the two of you to, and he tells me that he's so proud of his wife and loves his wife so much. And I learned a lot about Lebanon and whatnot. And you know what? It was just a little dose for 20 minutes of, hey man, I love you. I care about you. I really do. Man, do I believe in you? I want to know the magic sauce of raising kids that go to those kind of schools, man. That's impressive. And you know what? Let me give you something. Here's my podcast. It might help you live a little bit better. And I gave him my podcast. So that's how I try to live my life. Where did you learn that? I mean, I, I feel like I've been that way as well. And then when I read how to win friends and influence people, then I had language around it and I could yeah. be much more intentional about it. Did you, did you have a mentor or some book that you came across that kind of gave you the, the keys to that? Well, blueprint? I learned it at McKinley. I felt it when I was at McKinley, when I was with my boys. And then hmm. I, uh, the first time one of my salespeople in business got up and talked and he has since passed away, but he was much older than me. I was like 25 and he was like 65. Mm -hmm. And he got up and he, and he won this award. And he said, I just wanna thank my mentor. 65 year old man with a 25 year old mentor. And he goes, you might think, what does a 25 year old man have to give me? Cause this is what we all think. What do I have to give? What mm -hmm. do I have? And he said to me, got very emotional and he goes, that young man over there is the first man in my life to really believe in me. Hmm. He really believes in me. And he was a religious person. And he said, he sees Jesus in me. He sees my gifts. He sees what I'm great at. He loves me. And you know what? I've learned a lot about him, how to do this business better. And I went, wait a minute. That's what I was doing with Raul at McKinley. It's the same thing. This works with every human being in the world. And I sort of became my own vernacular in my own language. Now I've read a bunch of books that talk about be present with people and love people and all that other stuff. But really I learned it in those moments when I started at McKinley and I learned it in business. And I have found in my life that um, the way that people know that you care about them, how do I get people to find their giftedness? Every single human's walking around with two or three beautiful gifts that are just special to them. It could be their beauty, their intellect, their humor, their problem solving, their kindness, their patience, right? Their resiliency their intellect, whatever it might be. And if you tell somebody, hey, you know, I love you so much. You know, I believe in you so much, this, this, and this. And it's something they already know to be true about themselves. And then you link it to them doing something great. You're going to be on a list of less than one to three people in their entire life who have ever touched them like that. And so for me, what I love when I meet, what I wasn't doing with the Uber guy was listening for the story, although I was, I was listening for his gifts. Mm. And then to be able to say, I know why your children are so successful because you love them so deeply and you're such a kind man and you're willing to do anything for your family, anything, even drive an Uber after you worked a full day. And he just lit up and he went, I do love my family. Very emotional. I would do anything for my children. And I said, I think your wife would too. And he goes, Oh, even more than me. I think today he's remembering that conversation because it was real. And it's really true. And I started to think, am I that kind of father? Would I do what he's willing to do? Would I have overcome what he's willing to overcome? Man. So I just think when you have a real love for people and you go, I want to open this gift up. And when I open the gift, I'm going to try to uncover what their gifts are. And then just tell them, just tell them. You will see humans light up and all the noise of the world, all the stress, all the conflict, all the this, that, left, right, south, north, you know, all... For you to have those kind of exchanges with human beings is the most beautiful thing you could possibly do. And yeah, you know what, by the way, if you're in business, you could probably make a fortune doing it. But that ought to not be your reason for doing it. It ought to not be your intention. Your intention ought to be to just make a difference in someone else's life. And man, will you begin to light up? You want to have your confidence go through the roof? Walk around life like that. Link your confidence. You know, I say this in the book to your intentions. 
Not a, people keep linking their confidence to their abilities or their achievements. Well, you're going to chase that forever. What if your confidence came from, I'm a good man. I'm a good woman. My intent is to do good. My intent is to serve. My intent is to contribute. Man, will you light up with confidence when you know to say something true about yourself like that? Yeah, it sounds like you got a lot of that from your dad, too, because he didn't really care a lot about your material success. Oh. He, would, he would reemphasize that it's so important for you to be a good man and, you know, be there for other people and help people feel seen and heard. And I, I feel like he's one of your I, guardian I, angels, man. Yeah, I can honestly tell you that in my dad's case, like, I think you know this, but I would, my dad and I golfed. We're both crappy golfers, but we love to golf. And I would say, hey, dad, let's jump on the jet. Let's fly to Maui and play some golf. I got a business meeting over there. My old man was, my dad never went on my airplane. My plane was parked. My dad could walk from my dad's house. Well, it would be a long walk, but he could get to the, he could get to my plane in three minutes in a car. My father never went on my private jet. I've had five of them. I don't say that to brag. I say that to you that he had five opportunities, never went on it. I'm going to say, dad, let's go to Maui and play this great golf course on the ocean. This is how beautiful and simple my family is. My dad would go, well, why, why would we do that? We could just play, we could just go play El Prado and Chino, the Muni. I said, but dad, it's crap. Cool. He goes, I don't care about the golf course. I get five hours with my son. Mm. I don't care about the golf. And this is a lesson. You want to know the power of one more? I take it from you. Then you understand how beautiful having one more chance is, one more decision. My dad died last year. I told you my favorite things to golf. What do you think I would do right now? What I would give for one more round of golf with my, I can't even say it. You when had me crying in your book reading that part. I was like choking up. <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't not said that out loud since I wrote it. It's the first show I've said that. On. He died in October 2020. So I'm not even sure if you could even be in the room, you know, when all of that was happening. Yeah, I, I, was, I was with him when it happened. But do you know what I would give for one more round of golf with my dad? It, just to see him. Hey, dad, good putt. Yeah, I was pretty good, wasn't it, Eddie? You know. What would you give if you've lost somebody for one more conversation? Give anything. Right. What, how precious are people once you start understanding when I take the one more from you? And if you have people here that you still love, what if you started to approach that time when you walk in the room? What if this was the last one? What if I only had one more conversation, one more dinner, one more whatever it is with them? If they have passed away like my dad has, honor them with who you become with the one mores in your life. But I can tell you when you shrink it down, by the way, you're going to have one more day someday too. You're going to be my dad someday where you have one more day, one more hour, one more breath. And so the question Talk about becomes, what you witnessed your dad doing as a sponsor, as an AA sponsor all the way up until the end. Yeah. I didn't know this because my dad was in a, you know, a anonymous program, but when he died, I found all these index cards with all these initials on it up in his bureau. And what they were, were the, there's hundreds of them. There were the, the at sobriety one day anniversary dates of their sobriety. My dad would call all these people, hundreds of them and say, Hey, stay sober one more day. Happy birthday. And these were all people that my dad would help get sober. I, my dad would go to bars and pull people out of them. He would text message. He'd have early breakfast, late night conversations. And as he was passing away, his phone kept ringing and my dad had a breathing. My dad had lung issues and he would breathe, breathe like that. And some breaths were three minutes, three breaths a minute. Some were 30. His phone kept ringing. And he says, my mom's name is Debbie. And my dad's going to pass away within the hour, mm -hmm. within a few hours. Debbie, who's calling? And he's on morphine. And my mom goes, Ed, it doesn't matter who's calling. You're not taking the call. Right? <laughs> There's no Instagram going to be on this. There's no nothing. And my dad, who is it? And my mom says, it's someone named Raul. And my dad, give me the phone. My dad knew. My dad knew that Raul was probably about to go drink again. Mm. And he took the call. Mm. And my mom held the phone up to my dad's ear as my dad was passing. And my dad talked to Raul for almost 20 minutes and said the right things about, he said to him, he said, Raul, just don't drink for one more day. Mm. one more day and Raul spoke at my dad's funeral and it was a guy who was incarcerated for 20 years he was incarcerated for manslaughter my dad helped all kinds of different people and Raul said the words that I've heard many times myself because my dad had the same name as me he said Ed Milet changed my life except it wasn't me it was my dad mm. and uh, that's because in life we don't get anything except who we are we don't even always get our goals you know I say this in the book we always 
to get our standards. And my dad's standard was to always help one more person. And so he did it to his last hours of his life. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.